Welcome to Elections 2024 on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech, and I want to thank former Governor John Wahei for hosting this program. Today, we'll talk about the candidates and platforms we should be focusing on. Our guests for the discussion are Chad Blair, news editor of Civil Beat, who's planning to go to the Democratic National Convention, and Colin Moore, director of the UH Public Policy Center. As co-host, I may also provide some input. Election day is only four months away, and the stakes and budgets are high, perhaps higher than ever before. John Wahey, along with former governors Ben Caetano and Neil Abercrombie, have said that Joe Biden should bow out as a result of his performance at the recent debate. Should Biden bow out? How should he, his advisors, and the public react to the daily public expressions on that question? Would it be better if they discussed this in private? So now, let's join our panel. Not uh, in public like this, because if he decides not to take the advice, it's just uh, like, uh, you know, shutting another door or put a door to victory. Um, and, and I thought about that. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe this is for, for you, Jay. You know, who are we really talking to? I mean, was the letter really for the president? I mean, at this stage of the game, are you really talking to... Now, I do know that personal friends and others are calling on him and, and, and doing this. But wouldn't you, like a case message, a three-governor message, a, a message in the boonies someplace, isn't that really a conversation with the forces behind the presidency? With the guys who are putting together the campaign uh, and, and basically telling them, hey, guys, you, you know, whatever it is, you messed up too much. And, and uh, you know, this is it. I mean, we got we can't afford it. Uh, you can't let your guy go to the most important debate of his life and show up tired. You just don't do that. What do you think? Is there is there I mean, who is the message really for? Well, I think the message is for the media. That sounds like Marshall McLuhan, doesn't it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the message is for the media. It's the Greek chorus. It's the larger jury out there. And if they all say the same thing, it's really hard to resist that. Right now, they're not saying the same thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people um, are confused by it. You know, on one day, the New York Times editorial board says uh, that Joe Biden ought to bow out. A couple days later, it says in, in an editorial board opinion that Donald Trump is unworthy and unfit and dangerous. So what are we supposed to do? That's I mean, not inconsistent, no though, is leadership it? leadership as to which direction to go. And we are waiting for the media to coalesce. Um, the, the people, you know, in his chambers, you know, and the, in the, in the couches in the Oval Office, so to speak, um, they're not necessarily the audience. Okay, so let's bring this home to Hawaii. So we got fun on the national level. And uh, now here we are in Hawaii. There's some really interesting races. There's, uh, <laughs> there's Colin's favorite race between uh, Psyche and... Uh, Iwamoto. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Iwamoto. What do you think? Three times the charm? Um, I, I think it's unlikely. I mean, look, I wouldn't want to count Kim Koka Iwamoto out. She's shown to be a strong campaigner. She has a lot of resources, um, but she's tried twice. Um, I think Scott Psyche is taking it more seriously than ever this time. I mean, he has new signs. Uh, you know, what, is, what is this new tagline? It's uh, action, not just talk. Um, and I think he's trying to leverage that to emphasize the accomplishments that the ledge made this session. And the big one, of course, is, is tax cuts. Um, so I think the speaker is in a relatively strong position, probably stronger than he's been in the last couple of years. But you know, we, we've talked about this in other programs, and that district is a is an unpredictable one. First, there's a lot of new people moving into Kaka'ako. It's a really hard district to campaign in because it's all condo towers. Sometimes they invite you know the candidates to talk to the to the condo association boards, and they let them into the building. Other times. Absolutely not. So it's it's an unpredictable one. But all that said, um, I do think that the speaker is in a pretty good position to 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 get to win re-election. But it's going to be close again, just because um, 
Kim Koka Iwamoto has the resources to to campaign hard, and we know she's going to. Yeah, and she's very determined. So, uh, Chad, what's your favorite race? <laughs> well, certainly the, the the Psyche Iwamoto race is important. I, I'll agree with what, what Colin had to say. I'll just add one thing, and then I'll mention uh, some other races that – or a, another race that's my favorite – I think uh, it's not just Kaka'ako, it's it's Ala Moana, it's downtown. But remember, it's about 160 votes margin mm -hmm. between the two of them. And while I think Psyche is definitely taking it much more seriously, and he's got a lot of money in the bank, as you know, Governor, having campaign, that's that's 160 more handshakes, right? 160 yeah. more on the door. But because it's condos, you can't always just can't just go to door to door like you can in a, a neighborhood of homes. I think the races that I'm most interested in are uh, is Mitch Roth on, on the Big Island. Oh. I think, yeah, I think Kimo Alameda has given him a run for his money. If I remember correctly, the way it works on the Big Island is that unless you get 50% plus one, isn't that how it works? 50% plus one. Yeah, the, the top two uh, advance. That's unlike Maui, where I think the top two have to advance anyway. Of course, there's no Maui mayor race this year, but that looks like a competitive race. And there's also several other candidates in that. One other thing about uh, Big Island, a lot of, I mean, even though we have reported that the number of candidates running this year is down significantly to 2022 or 2020, not so on the Big Island. There are some hugely contested races for the county council there. Uh, and that's pretty encouraging to see. And and we're actually spending some time. We're going over next week. So we'll be to interview some of those candidates and broadcast that. So that's kind of where I have my eye right now. Jay, any? Uh... Let me add that uh, Civil Beat had an article about these young voters who were really not equipped to, to vote. <clears throat> you know, we've been progressive in the sense that we've allowed people at, at uh, early ages to vote, but we haven't necessarily trained them to vote. So civics is uh, is not taught, and uh, they are uneducated. I suppose if they all read Civil Beat, they'd be much better off. But I'm, I'm not sure they. I'm Chad. I'm not sure they do. <laughs> and so you know, you get a kind of a skewed thing here. You get a popularity contest, name recognition contest, and I'm not sure it comes out right. Also, you know, I think that the the national story is going to affect. Um, legislation and, and these campaigns in Hawaii. Um, and I also think the national story more and more focuses on Trump, better or worse. Um, and if he wins, if the Republicans take all those states, um, that's going to have an effect on Hawaii. There are Republican contenders in many, many of the state elections this year. Um, and, I, and I think we, we should be ready for a, a surprise, not, not necessarily in the campaigns leading up to November, but in the way things work in Hawaii after November. Well, what do you mean by add, that? I might yeah. add that the issues in the state, you know, um, are, are so similar in, in some ways that people's consciousness of those issues is similar to their national. You can conflate the two so easily um, and, and, and vote on, on that basis. Um, and, I, and I think it's worth mentioning uh, that the, the issues in the state um, do do overlap in some ways. I love to go down that, that trail a little bit, Jay. Go, go ahead. So um, the um, issues in Hawaii are, um, and, and the civil beat written about this, the government, the governor's emergency and censorship powers. Um, so has Kali'i Akina, by the way. Um, uh, the economy, of course, that's very important. Diversification, I'm not sure that that's a, a live, a live issue, but that is, it is for me. Um, housing, everybody talks about housing. Everybody talks about affordability. Everybody talks about climate change, although you know I don't think we're, you know, uh, making headway on that very much. What about the social issues, which seem to be, uh, at least from my perspective, seem to be the uh, the bedrock uh, of the uh, of the Trump of the Trump uh, movement. I mean, things like, uh, I hate to use the word, but like Christian nationalism in its, in its, in its twisted form. Uh, and uh, and how, how, the, how much impact do you think those kinds of issues may have in, in the upcoming elections? Uh, well, let me say, if a, if a candidate, a state candidate got up and said, you know, I, I want to do something about, I want to make sure that we protect abortion. 
Uh, I want to make sure that we have liberal laws on immigration, gun violence. Um, that, that would resonate with people. They would like that. Whether it's a real state issue or not, I think they would like that, and they might vote for that person simply because that was part of the platform. But the other thing, the big thing, is the economy. Just as the economy is critically important on the national level, it is also critically important on the state level. Maui has dug a hole in our economy, and that hole will get deeper and deeper going forward. It will affect our economy in ways we can't even predict right now. And so I think people are concerned about the economy. They're concerned about the effect that Maui has had and will have about the economy. And that is very similar to their concerns about the national economy. You agree with that, Colin? I was going to say, let me let me push back a little bit. I mean, I think that that I agree with a lot of what Jay says, but I, I think that the social issues here don't have a whole lot of traction in the way they do on the mainland. I don't hear people talking about immigration here a whole lot. I mean, for some Republicans, but I don't tend to think it's at the top of the mind of voters. Um, I don't think that, um, I mean, I think there's a sense among voters that um, access to abortion is is safe in Hawaii. Um, you know, you do see, I mean, there certainly are reasons to be concerned and you see, I think, more progressive members um, who've advocated for, um, for further protections, but I don't see that motivating a lot of campaigns here. Um, I mean, I tend to see our, especially for the mainstream Democrats, I mean, the campaigns are, pretty non-ideological and pretty locally focused on issues like the cost of living and housing. I haven't seen too many people become particularly ideological um, in, in you know, the, what they're campaigning on, the issues they emphasize. Um, and uh, and so I, I think that is in some ways a, a distinction between the races here and what you see on the mainland. I mean, what about the right to carry? Um, I mean, that's certainly an issue that's motivated Republicans, for sure. Um, I don't I haven't heard a lot of Democrats, interestingly enough, use um, I mean, well, to some extent, I've seen this in some of the candidates platforms. They've talked about gun control, um, but I don't see that being a central issue of a lot of their of a lot of their campaigns. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I missed that. But um, I don't when I talk to the candidates and when I look at what they're campaigning on, um, the incumbents, the the Democrats, um, I don't see I don't see a those issues, them bringing up these more uh, ideologically charged issues all that often. If Colin and, uh, and Jay are correct, Jen, <laughs> what issues would a Republican run on? You know, uh, yeah, you can, we can talk about the economy and all of that, but it's not like Republicans who are, you know, getting laid off. Or, or, so where, where, where does this all come down? I would say a couple of things. I've actually read the platforms, all of them, <laughs> and <laughs> bylaws and constitutions and, and so forth for both the local Democratic Party and the local Republican Party. They were just updated in May. That's when they have their state conventions. Recall at the national level, Trump has been able to water down the position on abortion because the president believes that the the overturning of Roe versus Wade was not a good thing, generally speaking, although that's very fundamental to um, the Christian right and so forth. But I can tell you that uh, among these platform issues, there is a stand your ground position in the Republican platform. There is a honor marriage between one man and one woman. Um, and yes, there is an immigration plank as well, even though we are an ocean state and that's not really a serious problem. You look at the Democratic platform and it's you know LGBTQ protection, uh, honor the, the native indigenous people. There's some of that in the Republican Party uh, platform as well, but they are black and white as could be. Now, whether anybody actually follows those platforms, whether voters pay attention is another thing. But here's the second point I'll make. Among the Republicans who have been elected in the state legislature, almost all of them are from the west side of Oahu. And that includes Elijah Pirick, who's a, a minister, Diamond Garcia, uh, David Alcos. Uh, Kanati Souza is, is a bit more uh, less conservative than then. And you actually see them proposing bills on Stand Your Ground, on not having uh, mixed gender bathrooms and so forth. So if they could get their numbers, it could, and they're probably not going to get the numbers anytime soon to change the legislature. You could see how their platform informs their policy. Yeah, I don't think so. Now, I, you know, one of the interesting races um, 
between two individuals that I'm looking forward to seeing. And, and, and I don't know whether three governors, should, former governors, should even be messing around with elections. But nevertheless, uh, a dear friend of ours, Senator Clayton He, former Senator Clayton He, has decided to run against uh, Brandon Awa in the uh, for the Senate race on the on the windward side. And uh, Brandon is sort of an interesting guy. He's from the media. He's very, you know, good-looking, articulate, all the use, usual stuff. But he was a kind of an interesting Republican, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and uh, running against Clayton. Now, I, I don't know what the issues may be, actually, that would divide them. I, I suspect that... Uh, uh, I suspect that um, Brandon will be sticking closely to the Republican theme anyway. I mean, you know, bring make America great and all this. Kind of. uh, but on the real issues, uh, I think the fun in that campaign will be the, uh, the fact that neither one of these guys will hesitate a second to call the other one a jerk or something worse. I I think that's right. They, so so Brett Noah is known to be, uh, he, you know, he's not afraid to be a problem at the legislature. I mean, he, um, you know, he will vote against bills that have pretty much universal support. I mean, I think he sees that as a as a point of pride, as a, you know, an independent thinker. He's there's only two Republicans in the Senate, and from what I understand, they, they don't like each other too much. Um, you know, they couldn't even agree who was going to be leader. This, of, of course, is Senator uh, Kurt Favela. I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, like you were saying, Governor, I mean, he is he is known to not pull any punches, um, and so is Clayton He. So I would, I mean, that is a debate I would love to watch. I'm not sure exactly what the what the issues would be. I know that that Britain Awa has some conservative views, the more typically conservative views. Um, he's a little harder to characterize, I find, than than someone like Elijah Pirrick, who's more kind of straight down the 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 the, the right, but. Um, but it, it's going to be a fun race to watch because both of them are known to be so, so outspoken. Um, and uh, uh, so that's like I said, that's a, that's a debate I would be happy to happy to watch. Can I say something to that? Sure. Brenton um, is he's not really sticking to the Republican platform. That's not really what he's interested in. Um, he's he's a guy that. He, he, I call him Senator No. He votes no more than anybody in that entire building. He, even on the bills that you think would be popular, he just says no. His biggest gripe is that the government spends too much money and there has to be a rationale for it. His biggest mission is to somehow stop foreigners from buying property in Hawaii, which he can't do. But remember, Clayton He, who you and Governors Cayetano and Governor Abercrombie endorsed, has an opponent in the Democratic primary, Ben Schaefer, who has the backing of uh, guys like Mike McCartney and Charlie Taguchi. And so we'll see if he gets past that. Yeah, that would be an interesting that, that I, I forgot yeah. about that. This is, not a, he's, this is about a primary race. you know. Right. And then one other thing about Clayton, he, though, is he definitely has a record of accomplishments. The you know the same sex marriage bill was his mm -hmm. uh, head of the Supreme Court's action on that. He was a strong uh, figure leading the judiciary. Uh, had several tough nominations in there. Uh, he does like to get things done. Personality wise, though, I have to agree. If if Clayton defeats Ben, uh, the Brenton uh, Clayton uh, race in the general <laughs> will be one to watch for sure. <laughs> that should be fun. And, and, you know, I, what I'm interested, you know, in following is in the past, in the past, one of the, the, the just the, the, I guess you would call the bulwarks or something, or, uh, you know, foundations of the Democratic Party was their, uh, their relationship with labor. Mm -hmm. Their understanding with the demographics of Hawaii, uh, uh, you know, how that all fits together and sort of melting these coalitions. It, in the, it seems to me like in recent years, we've been tagged with uh, being too good at differentiating and then trying to slap them all back together again, you know. So 
it's, it's, it's that's the kind of politics now i i'm looking at the race and i'm wondering to myself what is the new coalition you know uh, the largest as i understand it the largest uh, ethnic group in hawaii right now is uh filipino and what's interesting about that is that they may not be the same Filipinos that built the Democratic Party. And I don't know, has anybody did anything on what that might mean for this election, uh, both for the Republicans and for, uh, uh, and for um, Trump in general, for his whole message? I mean, you, you got what is essentially a very religiously conservative element coming into Maui, for example, and having to put up with the idea that it's their jobs that we're supposed to be fighting for while people are fighting for the Aina. Now, if you, if you were a democratic strategist, uh, which one of you guys, which one of you professor types want to <laughs> suggest to democratic strategists what to do. I, I will start first. I know Colin will have things to say. People have been talking about a sleeping Filipino giant vote for decades. And the only time that it really has materialized with Ben Cayetano, who, by the way, it was a tough race. He ran against Pat Psyche and Frank Fossey. And then, of course, uh, Linda Lingle almost knocked him off. Uh, the Philippine Will Espero, who has run for higher office several times, said to me, Chad, Filipinos just don't have the money to give to candidates. They're just not paying attention. They're too busy working. Now, that's a broad brush. But, um, you know, look at the folks in Lahaina. The people, many of the people that were displaced were Filipino workers in the hotels. I haven't seen any real success in capitalizing on that. Uh, and, and when you talk about groups, I mean, the, the white group, the Howley group is still, I think, about 25, 30 percent, the part Hawaiian population. It's so mixed right now. Um, so I, I don't know that it's ever really going to materialize. It hasn't happened yet. Yes, there are more Filipinos in the legislature and in the county races, but I'll turn it over to Colin here on this point. No, I, I pretty much agree with you, Chad. I mean, it, 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 we, we've, all, we've been waiting for a long time for for. Um, for, for Filipino voters to turn out in the numbers that would give them the political power they they probably deserve, given how um, that they're the largest ethnic group in the state. But it hasn't really happened. I sometimes wonder if some of the voters, and I think this goes back to what you were saying, Governor, are a little cross-pressured. I mean, so we know that there are Filipinos who are strong union voters, of course, but I think that that's also a pretty religious community. I think sometimes that makes them uh, more attracted to Republican candidates. And I mean, I, I I haven't, I don't know if anyone's really done this analysis. We don't have that level of detail and exit polls here, but I would suspect that a lot of those voters, you know, are forming the basis of support for some of those candidates we've seen in, in Central and West Oahu, the Republicans who've done well, like Diamond Garcia, um, you know, like Elijah Pyrrhic, um, you know, and there's, um, you. I think you could say, tell a, a story too, I mean, the other area that has seen a lot of Republican success in interesting ways, I think, is, you know, out um, on the Leeward Coast and why and I, I mean, though there's strong Republican candidates out there, the, the fight for Miley Shima Bukuro's seat, I mean, that looks like it's going to be pretty fierce. I mean, the the, the, the Democratic primary there is interesting because the governor hasn't made an appointment. But, you know, that was something the Republicans came very close to capturing last time, largely on the basis, I think, of some Native Hawaiian support for for Republicans out there. So um, but but that's all to say that I think that we don't always see, I think, the the Filipinos, um, the, the strength they might have because they are cross pressured a little bit. I think that there are a lot of Filipino Republicans, uh, particularly more recent immigrants. I'd like to add some points to all of that. Go ahead. Number one is, um, you know, I went to the Mission Houses Museum, um, Oahu Cemetery Pupu Dinner a couple of weeks ago, if you've ever been there. It's quite remarkable. And, and they have actors who play the roles of dead people in the cemetery. And, and the star of the show was a woman who played a, a Japanese um, labor union person um, close to the turn of the century. Um, and she was talking about the relationship of the Japanese and the Filipinos um, because because the guys who owned the plantations were trying to set them against each other. I didn't really know about that. Um, and whenever the, the Japanese would raise their heads politically, um, they would hire more Filipinos. 
And uh, so it was, it was an interesting maneuver. And they did it again and again. And the Japanese became familiar with that, and so did the Filipinos. And the result is that they achieved the unions by getting together, by, by consolidating their efforts. Um, and it was, it was really a revelation to hear the way that happened. It was very important to me. Anyway, so you know, I'm thinking that um, you know, the Filipinos in general are not as, um, not as loud. Um, they, they are not uh, nearly as disruptive as some of the other candidates. Um, they are not necessarily as wealthy as a group as some of the other candidates. You have to raise money. And, and you know, the, the troubling thing about that is that exists here and on the mainland. The more money you raise, um, you know, the better off you are. Somehow the money turns into votes. Should it be that way? Um, and, and finally, I, I, you know, I just, uh, I, I just want to add that um, name recognition and uh, disruptive personalities really count on the mainland. Uh, as you can see, I don't know what you're talking about. A, a guy like Clayton, he, uh, you know, I, I know you, I know you supported him, John. Um, a guy like Clayton, he, he's a, a strong personality, and people vote on the basis of name recognition and strong personalities. One of the things that we may be doing is thinking that because somebody comes, ancestors come from the Philippines, thinking that everybody from the Philippines have the same. Uh, have the same political uh, they do not. Yeah, and, they do. And, and that I think is 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 an insight. Chad, you got anything else you want to add? Yeah, I just uh, you know remember it's Visayan, it's Ilicano, it's Tagalog. Uh, they're as diverse as Duterte and um, and Marcos, right? <laughs> or the Aquino. right. I mean, it's, yeah. we got to be careful about casting too broad of a brush, but um, we'll, we'll see. I, I'm not going to rule that one out. Just one other thing. There's so much intermarriage. There's so many people that are part Filipino, part Chinese, part Hawaiian. Yeah. And uh, also, we didn't have time, but this is going to be, this election is going to be the return of Kai Kaheli. Yeah. Oh, we'll yeah. See whether, we, we'll see whether that, whether, where that trail leads us in the future. But anyway, we're done for today, and I think we got a pretty good, exciting election lined up for everybody. Uh, Jay will be talking to Chad about the arrangements for, I guess, the second show when we can put a little bit more meat to this discussion. But I want to thank all of you uh, for participating. I want to thank those of uh, you out there in the audience who have joined us. Uh, for your participation and your commitment to uh, making Hawaii a better place. So with that, aloha, everybody, and mahalo.